Are the judges ready? And the timer. In the cathedral of Milan, the priest showed us two of St. Paul's fingers and one of St. Peter's. A bone of Judas Iscariot. It was black. And also bones of all the other disciples. A handkerchief in which the Savior had left the impression of his face. Among the most precious of the relics were a stone from the Holy Sepulcher. Part of the crown of thorns. They have a hole in it Notre Dame. A fragment of the purple robe worn by the Savior. A nail from the cross. And a picture of the virgin and child painted by the veritable hand of St. Luke. This is the second of St. Luke's virgins we have seen. Once a year, all these holy relics are carried in procession through the streets of Milan. This story takes place in 1867 on an excursion to Italy. We meet two American tourists, Mr. Mark Twain and the doctor. They encounter many humorous incidents as they tour Italy with Ferguson, the Italian tour guide. On one such tour, one of the relics they see is the Egyptian mummy. The Innocents Abroad by Mark Twain. I prefer not to describe St. Peter's. It has been done before. We stood reverently in the maritime prison where he was confined, where he converted the soldiers. And where tradition says, he caused a spring of water to flow in order that he might baptize them. But when they showed us the print of Peter's face and the hard stone of the prison wall, and said he made that about going up against it, we doubted. <laughs> and when also the monk at the church of San Sebastian showed us a paving stone with two great footprints in it, and said Peter's feet made those, we lacked confidence again. The monk said that angels came and liberated Peter from prison by night. And he started away from Rome by the Appian Way. The Savior met him and told him to go back, which he did. Peter left his footprints in the stone upon which he stood at the time. <laughs> it was not stated how it was ever discovered whose footprints they were, seeing the interview occurred secretly and at night. The print of the face in the prison was that of a man of common size. The footprints were those of a man ten or twelve feet high. <laughs> The, the discrepancy confirmed our unbelief. <laughs> I wish to say one word about Michelangelo. I used to worship the mighty genius of Michelangelo, great in everything he undertook. But I do not want Michelangelo for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, for tea, for supper, for between meals. I like a change occasionally. In Genoa, he designed everything. In Milan, he or his pupils designed everything. In Florence, he painted everything, designed everything nearly. And what he did not design, he used to sit on a favorite stone and look at. And they showed us the stone. <laughs> but here, here, it is frightful. He designed St. Peter's, he designed the Pope, he designed the Pantheon, the uniform of the Pope soldiers, the Tiber, the Vatican, the Colosseum, the Capitol, the Trumpian Rock, the Barbary Palace, St. John Lateran, the Campagna, the Appian Way, the Seven Hills, the Massacre of the Claudian Aqueduct, and the Coin of Maxima! I never felt so fervently thankful, so soothed, so tranquil, so filled with a blessed peace. As I did yesterday, when I learned. That Michelangelo was dead! <laughs> In this place, I may as well jot down a chapter concerning those necessary nuisances, European guides. Many a man has wished in his heart he could do without his guide, but knowing he could not, has wished he could get some amusement out of him. We accomplished this latter matter, and if our experience can be made useful to others, they are welcome to it. The gods in general are delighted to secure an American party because Americans deal so much in sentiment and emotion before any relic of Columbus. Come with me, gentlemen, come. I shall use a letter written by Christopher Colombo. Write it himself. Write it with his own hand. What the tell you, gentlemen, is not so? See, handwriting, Christopher Galambo, by himself. Um, uh, Ferguson, what did I understand you to say was the name of the party who wrote this? Christopher Galambo, the great Christopher Galambo. Uh, did he write it himself, or how? He wrote it himself. 
Christopher Colombo, his own handwriting, write by himself. Well, I have seen boys in America only 14 years old that could write better than that. <laughs> what? This is the great Christopher. I don't care who it is. It's the worst writing I ever saw. If you have got any specimens of penmanship of real merit, trot them out. And if you haven't, drive on. We drove on. <laughs> ah, gentlemen, you come with me. I show you a beautiful, oh, magnificent bust, Christopher Colombo. Splendid, grand, magnificent! Yeah. Oh, look, gentlemen, beautiful, <laughs> grand bust, Christopher Colombo. Beautiful bust, mwah, beautiful pedestal, mwah! Uh, Ferguson, what did you say this gentleman's name was? <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Colombo! The great Christopher Colombo! Christopher Colombo. The great Christopher Colombo. Well, what did he do? <laughs> Discover America! Discover America! Discover America. We're just from America ourselves. We heard nothing about it. Christopher Colombo. Pleasant name. Is. Is he dead? <laughs> Three hundred years! What did he die of? I do not know. I cannot tell. Smallpox think? I do not know, gentlemen. I do not know what he died of. Measles likely? Maybe. Maybe. I do not know. <laughs> I think he died of something. <laughs> Parents living? Impossible! Uh, which is the bust and which is the pedestal? <laughs> this, the bust. <laughs> this, the pedestal! <laughs> he had reserved what he considered to be his greatest wonder till the last. A royal Egyptian mummy. See, gentlemen, mummy, mummy. Uh, Ferguson, <laughs> what did I understand you to say the gentleman's name was? Name? He got no name. <laughs> mummy, Egyptian mummy. Yes, yes. Born here? No, <laughs> Egyptian mummy. Ah, uh, just so. Frenchman, I presume. No! Not Frenchman, not Roman! Born in Egypt! <laughs> Born in Egypt? Never heard of Egypt before. Foreign locality, likely. Mummy. Mummy. How calm he is! How self possessed! Is. Ah. Uh, is he dead? <laughs> Been dead three thousand years. There is one remark which never yet has failed to disgust these guys. We use it always when we can think of nothing else to say. After they have exhausted their enthusiasm, pointing out to us and praising the beauties of some ancient bronze image or broken-legged statue, we look at it stupidly and in silence. For five, ten, fifteen minutes, as long as we can hold out, in fact, and then ask, 